Good morning. We turn our attention again to the Gospel of John. Now we're in the seventh chapter. We're in the opening verses of the seventh chapter. And even though it seems like maybe not a lot is done, there is some things here that are, I think, quite instructive to us and well-fitting within what John intends to do, which is, as we know, the purpose of the entire work is to cause the reader to believe and by believing have life in his name. But we are dealing again in chapter 7 with unbelievers. We ended chapter 6 of the Gospel of John with the great crowds leaving Jesus, including many of the disciples, even though he had just fed them, fed many of them, thousands, in the wilderness. He told them then they only had come for the food, but they needed to really eat and drink him, eat his flesh and drink his blood. And they found this statement too challenging and too distasteful. And many, even the disciples, withdrew. And then the picture narrows even further from the thousands to the disciples to the just the twelve. And Jesus says, one of you even is of the devil. And so we end up with Jesus and the eleven almost in John 6. John 7 is a number of months later. John 6 was right before the Passover, and John 7 starts just before the Feast of Booth, which is six months later. So both of these chapters had started with people preparing to go to Jerusalem to the feast. And John 7 takes us back to Jerusalem after a little bit, and we'll find the situation down there in Jerusalem just as it had been the last time he was there, which is chapter 5. And in chapter 5, Jesus had healed the man at the pool on the Sabbath day and got into a heated discussion with the religious leaders to which they greatly took exception and wanted to kill him. We'll find that in Jerusalem, in the six months he's been gone, not much in that regard has changed. Up in Galilee, though, where Jesus had sloughed off so many of the disciples with hard teaching, we kind of have a quiet period where Jesus spends most of it in smaller incidents and in more personal teaching uh, with the devoted ones of his. And Matthew uh, 17, 18, and 19 cover this section of the Lord's ministry. It's also in Mark 9 and Luke 9. And what happened... There are a couple of really notable events there, like uh, the Transfiguration. But how many were witnesses of that? And there are a couple of uh, direct prophecies of Jesus telling of his uh, rejection and suffering uh, at the hands of the leaders that's going to come. This is when that odd little story about the, the taxes for the temple and the fish with a coin in his mouth occur. And Jesus teaches on forgiveness. And maybe for us, one of the most notable things he teaches in this period that we should really pay attention to is he teaches the parable of the unmerciful servant. So those are sort of the highlights that have happened in between John 6 and now John 7. So in John 7, we start in Galilee and we start among the few again, this time family members of Jesus Don't worry, before it's over, we'll be down in Jerusalem and we'll have lots of excitement again. So here, the gospel, John 7, we'll read the first 13 verses. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was near. Therefore his brothers said to him, Leave here and go into Judea, so your disciples may see your works, which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. 
for not even his brothers were believing in him. So Jesus said to them, my time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it, that its deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to the feast because my time has not yet fully come. Having said these things to them, he stayed in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly, but as if in secret. But when his brothers, pardon me, the next verse, verse 11. So the Jews were seeking him at the feast and were saying, where is he? There was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying he's a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads people astray. Yet no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. So we have here a great time of unbelief. Again, I note that for a book that is intended by its own stated purpose to cause us to believe, that John spends a lot of time talking about the unbelievers and why they didn't believe, the conditions of their unbelief. We have these leaders here who don't believe and never change. We have these family members who don't believe, and yet we come to find by the end of the Gospels and the beginning of the book of Acts, we find that they do believe. And so what is it that causes them to firm form early convictions, right or wrong, and stick to them. And yet others, they will change their conviction, some for the good and some for the bad. How can we approach Jesus and how can we come to the place that's expected here and hoped for here? How can we come to belief? Also, I want to note, we see here in verse 1, uh, and we see here, in verse 13, the word Jews. And sometimes that causes uh, a bit of uh, confusion. And also, for those who attack the Scriptures, say it's unworthy of our consideration and there's problems with it, uh, they'll say that such passages like this are anti-Semitic because it talks about the Jews so much and, and certainly there's a lot, awful lot of harm done to Jews, oftentimes by Christians, sometimes even in the name of Christ, which is unwarranted and unjustified. But we're going to note here a difference in the word Jew. Jew is used in two senses, maybe even three, just in this paragraph. (coughs) In verse (coughs) 1, Jesus was in Galilee. He would not go to Judea because of the Jews. Well, Judea and Jews are based on the same word. And there are some who think, and I think you're probably right, that some of these places where it says Jews, the word Judahite, or men of Judah, because, again, what's the root of the word Jew? It's the same root as the word Judah, right? Jew and Judah are the same root. It's talking about the Jews, and where are the Jews it's talking about? Well, they're in Judea. Well, if we're talking about him also, though, being in Galilee, how would we describe the people who live in Galilee? The Jews. But John is using John is using Jew here in a different sense, not just of everybody who's a member of this ethnic group, everybody who's a member of this religion, because everybody involved in the story is. Yet there's a group of people who are contrasted with the masses who are called Jews. And again, we saw this down at the verse... In verse 13, it said, Yet no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. Well, who's the everyone there? It's the entirety of the Jewish nation gathered together in Jerusalem. And who are the people who they're in fear of? Well, not the entirety of their nation, the entirety of their brethren, but who are they afraid of? The leaders in Judea. And so Jews is often used, especially in the Gospel of John, 
uh, of the rulers of Judea. And they did not have in the Greek language a different word for Judea and Jews. It was the, 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 when you talk about Jews, you're talking about the men of Judea. And so you have two uses of the exact same word. And we have that all over our English language where we have one word that means two or three different things, right? And we tell by context what it is. All right, so those leaders of Jerusalem, those are the Jews that Jesus was avoiding. Those are the Jews that, Jesus, that were wanting to kill Jesus. Those are the Jews that have the rest of the nation in fear. And what we have here then is we have this hateful, this hateful opposition. Again, so hateful that Jesus was unwilling, he said, verse 1, to even walk in Judea. He wouldn't go any place where these people had jurisdiction because they were so opposed to him. This goes back to chapter 5. Now again, chapter 6 had been up in Galilee. Chapter 5 had told us just before the witnesses' sermon, this. It said, for this reason, John 5, 18, therefore the Jews, again, these leaders of Judea, were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And then we had the great sermon of John 5, where Jesus shows himself and tells that he is one with the Father and that he is the giver of life. So the conclusion of that sermon, John 5, 44, beginning, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you don't seek the glory that's from the one and only God? Do you not think that I will accuse you before the Father? The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you've set your hope. If you believe Moses, you'd believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you don't believe his writings, how are you going to believe my words? And in John 5, there is no record of how they responded to that. Well, our record of how they responded to that is here in John 7, 1. That in those last six months, they didn't come to soften their hearts regarding Jesus and take it better. They just seethed in their hatred and they, they cemented their bad feelings. And so for the last six months, since Jesus had healed that lame man at the pool among them, on the Sabbath day, the more they mauled it over, they more, the more they concluded and supposed that he broke the Sabbath and that he blasphemed, and the more they mauled it over, the more guilty they thought he was, and the more they thought he had to go. Now, of course, the great irony is, what do they put Jesus to death for? Being a lawbreaker and a blasphemer. And let me ask you, who was the only person in the history of this world who was never a lawbreaker or a blasphemer? But look around and look in the mirror. And how far do you need to look to find somebody who's ever blasphemed or ever broke the law? So it's on our charges that he was put to death. Which is fitting because he was put to death on our account. And so on the thing that they did in spades, on the thing that every man has done in falling short of the glory of God, of breaking the law and blaspheming, they accused Jesus when they in fact were guilty. If we were psychologists, we'd call it projection. But we don't need that much kind of education and fancy words to say they're just human because that's what people do. They, call, they think others are doing the same sins as they. So this is that hateful opposition down in Jerusalem. And it's been going on for six months. So now we're to the next feast. But back up in Galilee, where Jesus has been out of the spotlight, particularly after sending so many away after the feeding of the 5,000 and the eat my flesh and drink my blood sermon, Jesus has been going about business quite quietly. And so his brother said, hey bud, um, you know what? It's feast time. Everybody's going to Jerusalem. Don't you need to get down there and tell everybody you're the Messiah? If you're the Messiah, huh? What about it? All right? Verse 3, his brother said, leave here and go to Judea. So your disciples can see your works, what you're doing. All right? Your disciples and you, not, not us, you, your thing, right? Uh, what, what is it? Anytime we want to distance ourselves from anything, what do we say? We say, well, that's your lookout, right? That's your thing. That's not mine. Or 
as one of my te- teenagers said a few years ago, and it was I, I'd never heard it, and it was clever enough, I, I, I borrowed it. Uh, he said, that sounds like an ish you, not an ish me, right? And so this is your thing, bud. It's not mine. So you go do your thing down there among them because, I mean, hey, if you're the Messiah guy, nobody does in secret if they want to be known publicly. <clears throat> Aren't you out there doing this? Well, get, get to it. Show yourself to the world. And that sounds awful distant and not very nice. And Oh, it sounds like a sounds like brother sometimes, yeah. But as it says, they were not believing in him. So the multiple brothers. Now, uh, we know from the, in the church later about James, the Lord's brother, who was uh, counted with the apostles, uh, was an elder in Jerusalem. Uh, we're very convinced wrote the book of James, that the brother Jude, who also... Uh, was a believer and wrote to the church as a wonderful little uh, little letter of exhortation uh, about a whose personal life we don't know. But uh, those were two of the brothers. And then uh, for real deep Bible trivia and extra points, who were the other brothers that were named? Simon and Judas. Uh, that's in Matthew. Matthew 13, uh, 54. Uh, the Jews are saying, look, look, we know this guy. How is it he has miraculous power? Is this not the carpenter's son, Matthew thirteen fifty five? Is not his mother called Mary, his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? So there's a Simon and a Judas in there as well. And then there's sisters, and honestly, I don't know their names. But if I had to bet, I bet you one of them is named Mary or Miriam, because every Jewish family had one of those. So I don't know. But uh, anyway, there is uh, uh, four brothers at least here, uh, James, Joseph, Simon, Jude, Or Judas. We got sisters too. And they say, Guy, if you're the Messiah, uh, you know, you're going about it all wrong. You shouldn't be here in this backwater. Of course, you know, they're from the backwater too. But they say, At least we acknowledge we're in a backwater. We're not in the center of things. Uh, You're the one who's supposed to be convincing the masses. And you're in too obscure a place. And you're talking to too few of people for this to ever get off the ground. And hasn't that been the charge oftentimes against Christians and Christianity that uh, by those in power and those who think about this world's uh, things of prominence? Uh, you guys don't have the budget for that. You guys don't have the publicity team. Uh, you guys don't, you're not in the right place. You're not with the movers and the shakers. Um, you know, so unbelievers always think Christian service and devotion is too small a thing. That it's not important enough. It should be bigger and splashier and, and more external. Of course, when we dive on the other side into the internals and get to the internal demands of Christianity and self-control and self-denial, they always think that's too much. So the externals, they always think Christianity is not enough. But of the internals, they always think it's too much. Uh, the, the view of the world by, uh, of Christians and Christianity by non-believers, it's always inverted. It's always exactly, it's always exactly backwards. So they want it to be big on the outside, and leave the inside alone. And there's a lot of churches that will cater to that kind of belief, right? The mega churches with the flashy programs and the splashy things and the lots of lights and the lots of glitter and lots of glam. But it leaves the inside alone. And so here Jesus is, you know, the same problems in the world that we face that uh, people think you're doing, they thought Jesus was doing Christianity wrong. even. Uh, but uh, the world didn't accept it. Uh, The world, in this case, even his near ones and his dear ones, his own kith and kin, they did not understand discipleship. They did not appreciate and share the demands and hardships of it with him, just as sometimes those that are near and dear to us don't share the demands and hardships of discipleship with us. And sometimes they'll criticize of what you're doing and how you're doing it and who you're doing it with. And Jesus, you know, he faced that very same temptation. Here he is in the very middle of his ministry, and his, only, his own family members are telling me he's doing it wrong. Well, you know, I might have got snarky, because you know me, I occasionally could get snarky, just every now and again. I'd say, well, yeah, I, I got the leaders of Jerusalem, I got them noticing me if they want to kill me. Right? But he doesn't say that. He doesn't snark back. Uh, he just tells them to go and do what they should do. And so whenever we feel estranged from this world, whenever even the closest to us 
Don't share the same experiences of the Savior with us. We realize he went through all this before. As it says in Hebrews 4.15, 4, 4, 4, 4, So we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And so any kind of criticism we'd face, and later we're going to move on here to talk about the world hating Jesus and hating his disciples. Any of that we face, we know he faced it first. And we know he faced it better. And we know he faced it in a way that would give us comfort and give us hope. And so he says, you know what, guys? It is not yet time for what y'all want. What y'all are calling for, he doesn't say it's coming, but we know it is. But he said it's not the time for it. My time is not yet here. But your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. And so we'll talk about that in a second. My, my time is not here, but your time is opportune. Now, his brothers, James and Jude and Simon, and what was the other one's name? I just, I just read them all, and I already forgot one of them. Um, Joseph, that's the one. I forgot, I forgot the one named after the day. James and Joseph, Simon and Judas. These men are men of Israel. Men born under the law, as Jesus was. Men who should keep the law of Moses. And so, what did the law of Moses said that these men should do? Go to Jerusalem for the feast, right? And when could they do that? Well, they should do it right now. The calendar says it's time to get going. It is time for them to do that. They have plenty of, they have this opportunity to go and do the things of regular obedience that God wants them to do. And for them to go down there and do that and to join the tens of, or maybe hundreds of thousands of people doing that, how does that change the world? It doesn't. They're just part of the crowd of people faithfully doing that piece and part of the law. And so uh, there's nothing particularly special about it. Now, it's good. Obedience is good. But regular obedience, it, 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 I mean, it's precious in the sight of God. Uh, maybe not with this attitude of unbelief here. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's nothing earth-shattering. They're just doing the right thing. And it's time for them, as always, to do that. Uh, kind of like when Jesus, and this was in John 12, but when Jesus was anointed uh, with the great uh, uh, perfume, uh, that great amount of perfume, and Judas Iscariot said, hey, we could have sold that and given it to the poor. What does Jesus say? The poor you what? You always have with you. So if you're really interested in the poor, then you basically have unlimited opportunities to serve the poor. Because when are the poor not around? So when it comes, if you're really interested in serving the poor, go ahead. You have unlimited opportunities. But what she's done is, is a one-time, it's got to be now thing. She can't do this a year from now, right? And she, she should, she, this thing she's doing of anointing me for burial, this is, this is a wonderful honor, and it sort of has to be done now. Well, Jesus is on a plan of things that can sort of only be done once. I mean, how many times can you die for the sins of the people? That's a one-time deal. And it's not quite time to bring that about. But he does say for his brothers, following the regular instructions of God, it's always time for that, isn't it? That is always opportune. And so, I don't need you guys around here telling me how to Messiah. I can have, you guys can go to Jerusalem and go be good and faithful Jews. Uh, but when they show up, it won't be noticed. It won't be significant. It will be to them and their obedience, of course. But it won't be significant to the history of the world that, uh, uh, you know, uh, James and, and Joseph and, and, uh, and Judas... And now I'm forgetting another one of their names. Anyway, when those four guys show up, it won't change the world, right? But when Jesus shows up in Jerusalem, what's going to happen? It's going to change the world. And so Jesus, he has to do things a little bit differently. And so he says about the world, verse 7, the world cannot hate you. You're, you're no threat to them. There's no difference in you. But it hates me. See, I'm there, when I'm there, I'm going to be the center of hatred because the world, and he's talking about these, this religious bureaucracy, crime family, priest thing running the temple. That's the world. 
these people had thought that's the way of God. Right. But these are people who'd made the house of prayer into a den of thieves. The world was in the temple. The world was running the temple. And so much of what's done in Christ's name today, it's the world running the church. And that's why they despise the church when it does what Jesus said. He said, it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. And so they didn't mind, you know, people from the carpenter's family in Nazareth, but they hated Jesus. Well, why? Because those other guys were, were just carpenters. Those other guys were just regular Joes. Those other guys were of no significance and they were of no threat. But Jesus was a threat to all of it because he showed them the power of God and called them all to repentance. And he shook people in the very foundations of their being. And he still does. And that's why when you just show up as you, if I just show up as J and do J things, I'm no threat to the world and the world. Uh, they don't particularly like me or dislike me, I don't think. They don't care about me because I'm inconsequential. But you and I, if we come in Jesus' name, and we come proclaiming the things of Jesus and showing the life and work and call of Jesus to repentance and thus through that to grace to God and reconciliation, a new way of life, the world hates that to death. The world hates you, John fifteen eighteen. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you're of the world, the world will love its own. But because you're not of this world, I chose you out of this world because of this, because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours. And so it's this Jesus connection which will make the apostles and later all disciples and later even us regular Christians, it's this Jesus connection that makes us odious to people. Jesus could have been popular with that crime family that ran the temple, those civil and religious authorities, if he'd gone there to work with them, shore up their power and their influence and cooperate with them, help them run the temple in the way they wanted, where they still had power and influence and wealth and privilege, but he got a cut, they'd all be for that. But he was against it all. He came asking everyone to humble themselves before him and before God, to realize and confess our sins and realize that here is the divine one of God among us. And thus we deny ourselves and we show a love of God above all else. And if you have that Jesus stink on you with that, they're going to hate you terribly. If you come in just, you know, as, as a normal person doing whatever they normally do, you're going to be fine. I'm trying to pick a job, a job here that nobody has. Let's say somebody here was a delivery man. And we just conscientiously and faithfully delivered our packages and made our rounds. Who would, everybody on the route would love us, right? Because we're a Christian, we're doing it conscientiously, we're doing it on time, we don't steal the packages. They love that part of Christianity. But as soon as you tell them, somebody says, man, I really like the job you're doing. You're so much more trustworthy than last delivery man. And the guy says, well, my Lord and Savior Jesus told me to do so. Or I do so because I follow Jesus. Uh, why don't I invite you to church? Oh, that, that delivery guy, can you believe that guy? 20 years he's been believing in our packages. He has the audacity to tell me that I should come to his church or he wants to tell me about something spiritual. And so here's Jesus, the very embodiment of this, the very center of this. Wherever he goes, because inherent in him in his very presence is this call to not love the world, but to love God above all things, to hate your own sin, your own self, your own pride. When Jesus goes, everywhere he goes, it's a spiritual battle royale. And so he can't just go march into Jerusalem with the rest of the pilgrims, right? What did we just study on Wednesday, or, yeah, Wednesday night in our Bible study? We studied about the triumphal entry. This is not a man who can quietly go into Jerusalem, right? Now there was a time for him to go in there hailed as king, and they put him to death a week later. But it's not time for him to go in there hailed as king. It's not time for that showdown to come yet. It's not time for that. 
And so, yes, everywhere Jesus goes, and whenever Jesus is brought up, there's some piece of that spiritual battle royale that takes place. And those who are on the winning side and on Jesus' side of the battle, they rejoice in it. And those who are on the losing side, and they feel in their conscience they're wrong, and they're, they're provoked, and they're pricked, they hate it. And they hate the people who are reminders of it. Jesus and his followers. So he said, yeah, you guys go up to the feast. He said, I'm going to stay in Galilee. Well, they went up to the feast. And there was a time to decide. And I mean by this last heading, there's a a bit of double meaning there. That the people, even Jesus' brothers, at this point, still had time to decide. But also, it's getting time to make a decision. It's getting time to decide. And so we have the patience of God, which Peter says we regard as salvation. We have the patience of God to give us time to decide. But folks, there is a time we have to decide. And we need to come down on the side of Jesus. So his brothers went up to the feast. They went and did the normal things that normal people do at the feast with all the Jews. And then he himself went up. So not in the way they wanted, not in the time he wanted. They didn't, he didn't go at all like they said to go, but he did go, but he went in his own way. But he went in secret. So the Jews were asking, this is the time given before Jesus reveals himself again. They're saying, where is he? See, that's the thing. Even when you hate Jesus and you can't stand the thought of him, there's, all, there's so oftentimes a, a call to mind of him. You know, the, the unbelievers, why are they constantly provoked by Jesus? Because he keeps coming to mind. It's a powerful thought. It's a powerful thing to think about the living God come to flesh and come to save us. And you just can't you know, reject that and go on without consequence. That, that, that barb is still there. There's still the question of where is he? And what's he doing? And how's this going to turn out? And there was grumbling. Grumbling among the crowds. Concerning him. Some were saying he's a good man. And others were saying, on the contrary, he leads the people astray. And so they're deciding, and they're, they're given some time to think about it uh, with each other. Remember, Jesus had said it's not, even from the beginning, and this is a theme that we have in John several times. We had it in chapter 5. We had it even as far back as chapter 2, the very first miracle, when Jesus' mother says to him, hey, there is no wine. And he said, woman, what does that have to do with us? He said, my time has not yet come. And even here, he says now again to his brothers, he said, my time is not yet come, but your time is opportune. So here are these people taking this opportune time to think about Jesus. They have time to decide things in their hearts. But we also note in this passage that such such decisions are never made in a vacuum. The decision that Jesus is the Messiah That he came to save me from my sins and so I'll put my trust in him. That's not a decision we just make academically. It's not just an intellectual decision. Because there's people out there that hate that. And there's people out there that cause this discussion to have to be done in quiet. Right? No one was speaking openly for fear of the Jews. There are people who have to make that decision on the down low. There are people who have to decide that while resisting the thoughts and pressures from outside. But then there's also disciples pushing back against it. No, he's a good man. No man nobody does these miracles. Nobody can uh, have these things which come only from God. Nobody can teach these things and prick our hearts like this if they're evil. So the disciples are pushing. And see, we have to make this decision about Christ and come to faith and trust in him in a world where we're being pushed some by both sides. If we're in an entirely religious environment, there might be the push in only one direction. But then what happens when we step out of that and we get the full gust of of wind and opposition from the world? Or what if we make this decision under this icy glare and hatred of the world and we don't have many who encourage us? And so this is a great mystery as to how this all works and as to how some come to believe and some don't. Those who stand side by side hearing the same sermon, seeing the same things one believes and another doesn't. 
And so we consider the implications and we consider the, compl- uh, the consequences of these decisions. What do we do if we really accept Jesus? What does that mean? Or, you know, that Jesus sounds pretty attractive, but if I go with him, there's all this hatred. And also then there's these people who get caught in the middle and they have this miserable life where their hearts are unsettled and they can't fully commit to the place of comfort, but they realize that the opposition isn't right. And so they linger trying to make a decision. And so sometimes like in the parable of the sower, you know, the seed falls on stony ground and it, it doesn't go anywhere. And sometimes the seed falls and it starts to sprout, but there's all the weeds around it that choke it out. And other times there's good soil where it produces abundantly. And so this is what's going on. And this is why I think John tells us in a book written for us to believe about the people here trying to come and grapple with belief. And a lot of them at this point not doing too well with it, right? A lot of unbelievers. A lot of unbelievers. But here in the privacy of families, these people at the great feast, one and one or two by two, in conversations where they have to keep the tones down so people can't overhear, and somebody doesn't come and berate them and dress them down or drag them to temple officials, the gospel is spreading. And the news about Jesus is on everyone's lips. And even today in places where there's official opposition or in places where it's, a, you know, it's not maybe against the law, but there's cultural and family expectations or other softer forms of discouragement and suppression, we have some who end up believing. But then in other places where belief is fostered and belief is, 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 grow, is you know, treated like a hothouse flower. It's, it's, it's like a, growing in a greenhouse where we give it every advantage. It's, yet in some hearts and some ground, it still won't prosper. We have the same thing here in John. And so, Jesus is about to reveal himself. The, the pump is actually more primed by his delaying. And Jesus is now going to come out at the feast and tell them more about what he's doing. And we'll find out who believes and who doesn't. And the Gospels tell us these stories. And that's one thing I really appreciate about the Gospels. Yes, John tells us he's writing for us to believe. But he doesn't hide the difficulties from us. He, he doesn't tell us a just so sugar-coated, you know, bedtime fairy tale story. He tells us a real story about real opposition and, and about real overcoming and about real faith in the presence of, of difficulties and oppositions. But in everything, what we learn is that Jesus is the way of life. And he is the one who is to be believed. And so that is a lesson we learn even here in this paragraph, the opening of John 7, even in this time of unbelief. All right, so with that we close. Offering you the lesson, hoping that you come to put your faith and your trust in Jesus, that you have it more secured all the time. That the opposition, which sometimes causes people not even to be able to speak openly about Jesus, and maybe not, you know, all the time legally, like, you know, some Chinese communist surveillance state, but uh, just some of the friends who police the conversations of friends groups and say, no, we're not talking about that here. There's still people who don't want him talked about openly. And yet still we must uh, have that light of Christ in our hearts and we must be through him a light to the world. Let us have the confidence to do that at all times and in all ways. Again, even in times of great unbelief.